and uh, I'm so happy that you are. You, you live in you live in Seattle or, or somewhere in the Northwest? Uh, Bellingham, which is not Noka Oi at this time. And, <laughs> have you been having weather too? <laughs> Uh, about a foot of snow last week. There was 85 mile an hour winds. Uh, we missed all that here. Wow, wow. Well, you love traveling just as much as I love traveling. But you have a very interesting story. Now you're a retired surgeon. You have four yep. four adult children, four grandchildren. You've been married 38 years, but you are not stopped by anything. You have been mountaineering, and have done some amazing adventures. And I wanted you to share a little bit about some of your adventures. I know I talked with David Corson about the latest trip you did, but let's go back. Let's go back to 1976 to um, when you went up, and I don't even know this peak, but it's a peak you went to, Aconcagua in 1976. Aconcagua. Aconcagua. And that's 23,000 feet high. Where in the world is that? It's on the border of Argentina and Chile, and it's the highest mountain in the world outside of Central Asia. Wow, really? So, so it, we were, it probably is even hard to get there. How, for, tell me about your journey there. Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, Argentina and Chile are beautiful countries. They're like California, uh, and it's an Italian-type atmosphere. If you went there, you'd feel like you were in Italy. It's really neat places. Um, when we went there in 1976, it was 1,000% per month inflation. And we were students, so we were just counting pennies, but you couldn't spend 20 bucks. You could go to a nice hotel for 4 or $5 a night. We had uh, You could get a beautiful steak, dinner, wine, wow. desserts, everything for a dollar. It was amazing. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> when you think about that, that is amazing. Well, what what drove, what what called you to try to climb these unbelievably high mountains? Well, I kind of enjoyed a little risk-taking throughout my whole life uh, when I was a kid. I'd climb trees, uh, jump off little cliffs and stuff like that. Uh, one memorable experience was uh, riding with my brother. My brother used to go down a steep hill on a wagon with me, but he was three years older, and his <laughs> legs and feet were the brakes. <laughs> well, I decided, I decided to do it once myself in front of my mother, taking my sister to the library. And I took off down the hill, and then I realized my legs didn't get there. Oh, no. And so I just went hurtling down the hill. My mom saw me scream, which prevented the car from hitting me in the intersection. Oh, my gosh. I went across the intersection, hit the curb, flew about 10 feet, and had the lecture, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> well, so, that, so that's, was, that's kind of risk-taking, but nothing compared to going up 23,000 feet. That's that's a lot well, lot more dangerous. I also went skydiving too, and I jumped out of an airplane the first time I ever rode in one. And wow! So, wow! I, 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 could, I could tell people I rode airplanes for three years and never landed. So you really do like the adventure. You're an, are you an adrenaline junkie? Uh, yeah, at, at sixty five, less so, but uh, you still like some of these things. Yeah, what, it's what? kind of. Interesting. The way I got into mountaineering is in 1972, spring quarter, I was in college, and I needed a couple credits, but I had $15 in the bank. Hmm. And there, there were two things I was interested in was scuba diving or mountaineering. And mountaineering was $10 and two credits. Scuba diving was $25 and zero credits. That's how I got into mountaineering. Well, that's a good reason. That makes total sense. But why did what what drove you to try to climb this mountain in that I'll get it yet Aconcagua 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 so, Yeah, and so it was a you know it's, it's a it was a decent little adventure uh, going down there, but uh, you know touring in South America, we also spent three months touring around there, so it was a it was a memorable trip. Mm -hmm. But uh, also went to Mount McKinley, Everest, and other places like that. Well, so did you get, you know, now there's so much equipment that they have. It's Isn't it mind-boggling what they have if you're going to climb a mountain? Now it's so high-tech. But back in 1976, it wasn't, was it? Well, you just needed basic stuff on Aconcagua. But uh, going up Mount McKinley, you, we were on a technical route on the south side of the mountain called the Cassine Ridge. And it's very rarely climbed. Um, and I took a 100-foot fall up there. Ouch. And had 
came down and uh, got flown out, I was able to walk. But uh, the day we flew out was my graduation day from medical school in San Francisco. I was up on Mount McKinley for my graduation day. Oh, that's a good. That's a good choice. I like that. That so it, it was it, it was a memorable day. It was May eighteenth, nineteen eighty, which was Mount St. Helens Day. Oh my gosh! Wow. So, so the bush bush pilot landed on the glacier, came out that. Mount St. Helens blew up, 80 people died, 50 square miles devastated. We were like, you know, what are you smoking? You know, wow. and then I found out later on it was true. Wow. So w- w- when you were there, I mean, that's still kind of hard weather in May. What was it like weather-wise? And that's, isn't that a major factor to consider when you're trying to climb these mountains? Well, Mount, Mount Kinley is one of the coldest mountains in the world. And, you know, because of the spinning of the earth and centrifugal force, the atmosphere uh, set, settles down around the equator. And so that's the only reason why Everest can be climbed without oxygen. But, you know, Mount McKinley's 20,000 feet, but it's got the oxygen equivalent of a 23,000-foot Himalayan peak. Oh, wow. Well, did you have to use oxygen on that? No, no, no. Wow. How long does it take to get up there? Uh, but McKinley uh, normally takes about two weeks wow. to climb. Two to three weeks to climb. Mm-hmm. That's quite a bit. So, how much how much preparing do you have to do on a climb like that? Well, if you do it the way we did it, it's called alpine style, and you 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 got to take all of your gear with you, mm-hmm. and so you have a minimum amount of stuff, which also means if you get in trouble, you're in big trouble. You mm-hmm. don't have a series of camps like we did on Mount Everest. On Mount Everest, we had eight camps. Wow. And so, um, you know, you go from one camp to another and haul gear up. Uh, but Mount McKinley didn't have that opportunity. You, you bring everything with you. And how many people did you have in your group? Uh, we had three. So that's still pretty limited. Um, what, what year did you do Mount McKinley? Uh, 1976. Oh, yeah, so that's still early, too. So so that was way before all the high-tech stuff as well. Yeah. And plus we got caught out there. Uh, we were, we were climbing. We had packs that were probably at least 50 pounds, and we were on uh, steep ice, 50 degrees. And I mean, mm. you're digging your, you're digging the picks of your tools in and the front points on your crampons, and bringing that up there several thousand feet. And we got to the uh, crest of the ridge, and the guy got there. We we're looking for a campsite because it was getting dark. He reached up on the top, and it was a fluted ice ridge. Pulled up on it. Looked down the other side. It was the same thing on the other side. So we were climbing for our lives, trying to find a place to stay. Hmm. And so finally, we found a rock that was big enough for the three of us just to lay oh. on. You couldn't put set up a tent. Hmm. And so we were up there all night. If a storm had come in, we would have been gone. What were and, the What were the temperatures up there? Oh, well, they get cold. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, you're a couple hundred miles from the Arctic Circle. It's uh, it's very cold. Wow. And the thoughts dancing through my head that night were laying out on the rock was uh, about the the German climber that fell on the north face of Iger in the 1930s. It was dangling there for two years before anybody came and got him down. I heard that story. That's, I mean, because that is, I mean, you get to that point, it really truly is life and death, isn't it? Uh, uh, Yes, it is. (laughs) So you wanted to get down as quickly as you could. I mean, it's lucky you didn't freeze up there, spending the night outside on the rock. We were very, 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 very fortunate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, didn't your wife at some point say, uh, what are you doing? Well, just before I got married. Okay. So that, <laughs> I thought that was the only reason. But, but she did let me go to Mount Everest because I was committed to Mount Everest before I got committed to her. So. Uh-huh. Now, this is like, what year were you doing Mount Everest? Uh, 1984. Okay. We were We were there for the, we were going through Tibet, and we were, doing the 60th anniversary of, of the uh, attempt uh, from the British on that side of the mountain. Mm. Well, in that, still in that time, there was all this... I went to Tibet once, but I think I went in 1997. But it's very, very controversial, and you have to be very careful because still the Chinese influence and everything, and there's um, political influence that sometimes actually keep you from getting into Tibet, right? Did you have any problems getting in that way? Well, back then... The first, we were like the third expedition to be allowed in uh, since the uh, Cold War got over. And so we were, it was all very primitive. Uh, We were walking around like Tiananmen Square, red 
uh, jacket, you know, we we're a foot taller than everybody else, and mm-hmm. people were pointing at us. Yeah. We were, it was kind of kind of unique. I mean, China was very, very uh, primitive back then. Even Beijing, you had buses and you had bicycles. Mm-hmm. When and I was there, it, same that, thing. Yeah, it was. It was in. I was there in eighty nine and uh, eighty eight, and and it was all bicycles. You saw very few cars back then, but that the good part was that you didn't get all the pollution. There still was some pollution from the diesel, but um, not the pollution that you see now. But they didn't have a train. Now they have the train that goes from China into Tibet. How did you get up to Tibet from China? Uh, we went through, t- uh, took a, like little divans. They drove us in there, and, and then we took uh, our Chinese army trucks from from the Korean War. Wow. Some of those, those trucks had a million miles on them. Wow. They'd, they'd break <laughs> down, and these guys would do repairs out in the middle of nowhere mm. that you wouldn't believe. You know, mm. very, very, uh, uh, you know, very, very talented people. You know, they well, it's a matter of survival for them, too. Well, now a lot of things have changed, and there's actually people that say, after some of the terrible accidents that have happened in the last three or four years, that it, 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 it's not a good idea to go. It's supposed to be so crowded now. But you were there before it became like the thing to do for everyone that wanted to do something exciting. Uh, a lot of Generation X people want to go to Everest just to do it, right? But you were there before all that, so you were doing it when it was still not all the the camps weren't all set up like they are now, right? Well, we were there. We were there in spring of 1984, and on our side of the mountain, a, a British, uh, the SAS troop, Special Air Services, they were there. That's like their Navy SEALs, mm. and they lost two people wow. on the North Base. We were we were the only climbers on in spring of 1984 that didn't lose anybody. Wow. Because well, we used our heads, and uh, we had a couple guys go up to 28-2, uh, 28, uh, uh, 28-4. And, I mean, I, I only made it to 25,500. Uh, only. To- only 25,500. <laughs> well, still a long ways to go to on a 29,000. It sure is. So w- did you have to use oxygen there? Uh, the, once we went above uh, twenty. 4,000 feet, uh, then we were using oxygen, yes. I remember when I was in Tibet, um, going over by from Kathmandu over there, I got, I got, um, I really got sick. I got altitude sickness, and, and it, it's not fun. It's it's really, you want to die when you have altitude. It's hard to describe when your body just wants to shut down. It was, actually, I was okay to about 14,000, but when I got up to 16, or close to 16, it was unbelievably difficult. So I mean I yeah. can't I can't imagine twenty five thousand. I'm, I'm trying to imagine that I can't. I mean my body would have a hard time. <laughs> but but remember you're doing it. We were there for three and a half months. Oh okay. And so yeah. we, we were there for actually on the mountain probably three months. Mm-hmm. You know almost. And so you have time to acclimatize. Yeah you do. Yeah absolutely. But still, it can be very hard. And what what time of the year were you up at Everest? Uh, you either do it spring or fall. Uh, you don't go in the summertime because that's when the monsoons come in and it's really high avalanche danger. Mm-hmm. So did you do it spring or fall? Uh, we did it in the spring. Yeah, that's a special time there. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, 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 you have better weather in the fall, but it's colder. Mm. And and then, you know, winter comes in early, you can have problems on that. So. so then you went, if that wasn't enough, you decided to go up Mount Rainier. <laughs> Tell me well, about I, I, Tell me about that adventure. I've climbed a dozen routes on Rainier. I've been up there multiple times. And uh, uh, the most memorable one was climbing the north face of Mount Rainier. Uh, if you ever go into Seattle and look at Mount Rainier, you'll see a big black face. Uh, that's the Willis Wall. And we were the last people to climb that in 1989. Wow. And we were saved only because someone answered the call of nature. And what could have turned out to be a major mountaineering tragedy turned into a triumph because of somebody answering the call of nature. Was there? Was there? What happened? What? What say? What happened that you had avoided? I usually get people's attention when I bring that up. Yes. <laughs> um, we were climbing up there, and um, you start out down around uh, nine thousand feet, and it's like a five thousand foot base. And as you start climbing up, uh, it's uh, dissolving uh, volcanic rock and ice. Uh, it starts warming up, and stuff starts coming down on you. And so you've got to worry about not only avalanche conditions, but rock fall and things like that. It's a very, very dangerous climb. So we got up to a place where there was a cliff band, about I guess about 12,000 feet. 
and we had to get through it. And there was only one way through it. There was kind of a, a gully that ended up on top of a almost vertical mud wall that maybe was 15 feet, 20 feet. And one guy said, hey, I got to go. And so here we were on about a 50-degree slope. So we roped into a frozen boulder that was there, and we let kept the guy on the, on the rope. And he went out there and did his business. And right then, a massive avalanche came down through that chute. Mm. It's like one of the great big cliffs up to, by the summit of Mount Rainier collapsed and came blasting wow. down through that chute all over the north face of Mount Rainier. If we'd been in that thing, we would have been gone. And so that guy saved our life. Oof. Well, did you have enough so, at that point to say, listen, I think I've had enough uh, close calls at this point to maybe to call it um, slow down a little bit on this mountain climbing? Well, with the thing, when you're in that position, to go down, it was getting warmer later in the day, and there was rock ball. We figured we're going to go for it mm. and not come back down again. Wow. And so I climbed the fastest I've ever climbed in mm. my life mm. uh, up the frozen mud wall and got up there, and we were like du- – hiding behind rocks on the way up there because we could just see the wall was ready to go again. It was a great big cliff, ice cliff. And, I mean, when it got to the top of that thing, we were, that was about the most relieved I've ever been in my life. Wow. Well, you've and had nobody, some... Nobody's climbed it since then. You've had some amazing adventures. And you're friends with David Corson, and you went with him um, last year on a rather interesting trip. Was That that was in Guam. Where, where did you go with him? Uh, we went to Vanuatu, uh which is about three hours from Australia, and it's the first island chain north of New Zealand. And so we were there to, uh, ministering to the uh, people, and, um, and I was providing medical care as much as I could and whatever I could do with my backpack. Um, and that was a really a, extraordinary experience, too. Um, nice nice people, uh, you know, very dignified uh, people, and it was, it was great to uh, help them out. Um, uh, one thing I would say is uh, for vacation spots, you know, we went we went to Fiji, uh, the islands of Vanuatu, Maui. If you're going to go on vacation, it's far better than those places. <laughs> I, I don't. The, the jungle was interesting, but you know, and the people were interesting and everything. But you know, stay on Maui if you want a vacation spot. I I can totally relate to that. Although we have to say we've had a little bit of rain and. Haleaka had a little bit of snow, so you know, but still compared to the rest of what you're going through in the rest of the country, um, I still have to say you're right, Maui no Kauai. <laughs> yeah. This is a this is a great place to be in January. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it's been really exciting here. Have you ever thought about doing a book about your some of your mountaineering adventures? Uh we've got a bunch of stuff I could do besides just the mountaineering. Uh, I should write a journal down for my kids someday. I'll you should. I'm, I'm not disciplined enough, so. Well, a little bit each day, you know, a little bit of writing each day. You'd be amazed if you just write a page or two each day, how it adds up over the course of a year. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been wonderful well, talking. When do you come back to, uh, when's your next adventure going to be happening? Well, we're going to go on a cruise uh, to Europe, and then we're going to go visit Israel. Uh, that's in April. Then we're going to go to Israel in June. And then um, one of the pastors that was with David uh, and I on Vanuatu, he wants to do a, uh, a river trip in eastern uh, Oregon, which is supposed to, the river starts out small, like creek size, and you go through the mountains. That's several days. Uh, that's going to be in late June. I'm looking forward to that. Well, you're staying traveling there. You're staying busy. And uh, it sounds like some wonderful, wonderful trips you have. And I appreciate you taking the time to call in and share some of your exciting adventures i mean i can only imagine it sounds like a fascinating journey and it hasn't stopped yet you've got more exciting adventures yet to come so thanks so much for taking the time to call in um you don't have a website or anything you just you're just doing this as hobbies right i'm just just me (laughs) it's amazing it's amazing well